Well, now that I'm a dad, I'm starting to think dad type things, and I remember something my dad told me uh, just last week. He, it was two weeks ago, he looked at me with a growl in his personality, and he said, you don't have a stud finder? I'm like, no, I don't have a stud finder. He's like, do you even know what a stud finder is? So I, I, kind of, I know what a stud finder is, but I don't have one. It, it had the, the constant conversation. Have you ever had that conversation with your dad? Maybe if your dad's a handyman and you're not a handyman. That has been my, um, my entire life. My dad is a super handyman. He did everything. Like his first car, he built his own car when he was 16. Um, he has a million tools. He has a tool for everything. He's got like three tool chests. His office is organized. His, his not his office, his garage is organized. He doesn't do that work in the office, sorry. Um, it's all organized. Everything's perfect. If it's not where it needs to be, he's like, where are my tools go? It's like, dude, I didn't touch your tools. Like, you know where your tools are at. And he has all these tools. And he told me the other day, he's like, you don't, you don't know what a stud finder is? Like, and I'm like, I'm getting there. I'm learning. I'm, learning. I'm getting better. So as we've had our own place, we've been starting to do more. And I'm doing more things. But it, it's so interesting that he treats it like it's such a basic thing. He's like, you should know what these basic things are. You should know what a crescent wrench is. You should know what these types of things are. And if you don't know, you're behind. And I always feel behind because I'm like, like, well, you never made me do any handyman tools like when I was growing up. Like, so, sorry, I was the Orange County kid. You were a Long Beach kid, so that's, you know all the tools. I don't know the tools, man. Um, I don't want to tell you. Um, but it's such a basic thing, and now I'm learning, so I'm not as far behind as I'm projecting like I'm terrible with handy things. I'm, I'm not great. I can put together the Ikea furniture um, as long as there's instructions. Um, but maybe that's how you are. Maybe you felt that way. But there are some things that are so basic that God commands all of us to know. And it's almost like in Scripture, it's expected that we know what they are. And we, we're expected that we should know how to do certain things. And the thing we're going to look at tonight is where Paul goes along to this church in Corinth and says, I expect that you guys should have known how to do this one thing. And the fact that you can't do this one thing shows that you're not as far along in your Christian walk as you need to be, or maybe as you think you are. And that is kind of a rebuke that he's going to give to this church. And tonight, I want to take that rebuke seriously and think for us, do we know how to do this thing that Paul is going to say, it is expected that you should know how to do this. And what he's going to tell them to do is he says, you should know how to deal with relationship drama within the church. You should know how to deal with that. And if you don't know how to deal with that, you're behind in a certain way. So I want to check out this text, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Please grab a Bible or grab a device and let's look at it together. 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to spend the time tonight looking at eight verses. First eight verses of this chapter, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1. We remember last week it was that hard text about this man in the church who was in sexual sin. He was with his father's wife, so maybe his stepmom, in some sexual way. And the whole church knew about it. But the problem was nobody did anything about it. And Paul rebukes not only the person, but also the church. And the main problem is he basically says, do you guys not realize that you are giving Christians a bad name? Do you not realize that your church is paralyzed by this sin? There's sin in the church. Everybody knows about it and you're not doing anything about it. You know what that shows? It shows that you guys are not serious about sin. That's what he tells these Corinthians. He's basically going to do the same thing, but with a different problem in chapter 6. So chapter 6, verse 1, he asks them a question. And I I don't know if you can count the question marks, but there are eight question marks in the Greek text. There are eight questions that are asked, eight questions that you see here. Let's check them out in these eight verses. First question, he says, when one of you has a grievance against another. Another way to put that is you have a disagreement. There's some problem between two Christians. Does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints. So he says, how dare you take a problem that you have with another Christian, take it up, leave the church, go outside and complain to some other authority. And specifically, he's talking about a lawsuit. He's basically saying, if you have a disagreement with another Christian, are you going to sue that other Christian? That other cr- Christian? And then he has a question mark, right? Are you going to sue them? And the reality is, he's not asking because he heard that someone might sue somebody. The reality is, people were doing that in this church. Uh, a lot of scholars look at this text and say, it's not that it happened once. This has been happening multiple times, and it seems like that could be the case. These people were taking their problems, and it, I mean, I want you to imagine this. It was like all their problems were happening inside the church. They were taking it, lifting it out of the church, taking it to the world, and displaying it to the whole world. And say, these are our problems. Judge, deal with this arbitrate for us. And he says, how dare you do that? In- instead of talking to the saints about it. So there's an expectation that the Christians inside the church should be dealing with the problems that are happening inside the church. Just kind of like a family. You want to deal with your family problems inside your family, right? You only go outside the family if 
the family can't deal with it. That's kind of what he's telling these Christians. Verse number two it says, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world, right? That's a big claim. He's saying there will come a day, and he's, he asks them, it's like, you guys should know this. He says, don't you know that saints, you guys, you guys can't claim to be saints here in this church in Corinth, don't you know that one day you're supposed to be the ones judging the world? And you're thinking, what is that talking about? He's talking about his eschatology here. He's looking to the future, right? We see in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, that it says the saints will possess the kingdom with the Messiah figure. In the New Testament, that's even made more clear, that we're going to rule and reign with Jesus in his kingdom. So the whole point is, he says, you're going to have authority one day over groups of people to arbitrate, okay? But here's the problem. You're not arbitrating the tiny little problems that are going on inside the church, you're going to one day be expected to do this big thing, but you're not even dealing with the little things in the church. He says, in the, if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? He's calling the problems in this church trivial, which our relationship problems never feel trivial, do they? Or they feel like this is a huge deal. This is the end of the world. I, we need to have this dealt with. Well, he says they're trivial. Verse number three, he says, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Question mark, right? Judge angels, what is he talking about, right? There's a lot of different views on this. I think the best view is that in this new world where Jesus is king, that it says in Psalm chapter eight, eight as well, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that one day men will rise above angels, okay? Why? Because men are made in the image of God in a way that angels are not, okay? So at this time right now, angels are more glorious than us, okay? That's why if your theology says that when you die, you'll become an angel, right? That's wrong, you will never be an angel. You will always be a human being, right? Whether on this life or the next, you will still be human. But it says that right now in Psalm 8, you are a little lower than the angels for now. But one day you will rise above the angels because God has shown his grace on you as, as a Christian, okay? So here's the point. He says, one day you're gonna rule and be in charge, but you can't deal with these small problems now. He says, how much more then the matters pertaining to this life? He's saying, you gotta learn how to have discernment in this life to deal with these issues. Verse number four. He says, so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I don't think he's talking about, a lot of people say, oh, well, he's saying, you know, he's going to people in the church that aren't important. I don't think that's what he's saying. He says, why would you take these problems outside the church to people who are judges and magistrates out there? Which again, don't you see the, the underlying assumption for Paul? The underlying assumption for Paul is Christians are supposed to have the faculties to do this better than anyone else. Right? The Christians in your small group should be better arbitrators of your problems than you know, the person who has a reality TV show, right? the, the, the person at a counseling desk out in the secular world, the person who, who's even a judge. The people in your small group, if they're in Christ, they should have more faculties. They should have more ability and more resources to discern right and wrong than even the outside world does. That is the underlying assumption that Paul has here. Verse number four, he says, I say this to your shame. Remember, Last chapter, he says, I don't say these things to you to be ashamed. That was actually chapter four. He says, I don't write these things to you to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as beloved children. That was 414. Now he's saying, I do say this to your shame. All right, before I was being nicer, now Paul's getting a little bit more mean. He's like, look, you should be ashamed of this. Just like my dad says, you should be ashamed that you don't know how to use the tools. All right? Paul says, you should be ashamed that you don't know how to deal with relationship problems in this church. He says, can it be that there is no one among you who is wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? Do you see how when there's problems in the church, Paul doesn't just say, hey, this person has a problem, you're in trouble, but everybody else, you're fine, right? That's never his attitude. His attitude is always, if there's someone with a problem in the church and nobody's dealing with it, not only is that person with a problem in the wrong, but also the people around them who didn't help, okay? So there's a communal responsibility that we have in Christ to take care of the people in our church. And what he says here is, it's like, is there no one smart enough to deal with this? Do you remember in the book of 1 Corinthians, the beginning part, what did these Corinthians claim they were? What was the thing they wanted to be known as? Right, one word, wise. They wanted to be wise. They wanted to be seen as lofty. Paul sarcastically says, hey, is no one smart enough right, to deal with this? Is no one wise enough to deal with this? You should have been wise enough. That's what he says. He says, to settle a dispute between the brothers. But, verse number six, brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Verse number seven, this is the most radical statement that he's gonna make so far. This is something that we can take into our context because you might be thinking, well, I'm not suing anybody. I'm not in any lawsuits. There's nobody who's suing me within the church. That's good. That's a good start. But this goes beyond legal matters. He says, 
to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you, okay? When you have a lawsuit, let's say you're a person who's going to sue somebody. The point is you want to win, correct? You want to be the one who comes out on top. You don't want to be defeated. You want to have the win. Here's what he's saying. To go into the court, to present a case against another Christian to a bunch of non-Christians, the moment you present your case, you already lost. It's a lose-lose situation, right? Because if you lose, well, then you lost double. And if you win, you still lost because you took your problems outside the church to be dealt with by some non-Christians. And then guess what you do? You show the church or you show the world how evil the church is, okay? Which again, I'm not saying we want to be hypocrites and pretend like everything's fine, but the command here is to deal with sin collectively, to deal with sin in the church. Don't go outside to deal with these problems. He says, why not rather you suffer wrong? He says, in all this, it's like you should have known it's a lose-lose to go to to court against somebody in the church, okay? You know what's not a lose-lose? If you suffer wrong, okay? I want you to imagine what this lawsuit was about. It doesn't tell us what it's about. A lot of people think it's about property. So, you know, somebody, you know, had property. Maybe it's a family member. We don't know, right? But the point is, there's some legal matter which usually has to do with money, okay? You lost money. You lost your property. Imagine somehow you, you let someone in the church, you know, invest all your money. Let's just say that happens in the church a lot. And then you lose all the money because the person who invested it squandered it. Okay. Now you want your money back. Right now you say, I'm going to sue this person. Okay. Here's what Paul says, right? That's kind of a modern day example, but here's what Paul says. Why not rather lose the money? Why not rather suffer wrong? Let's say maybe you give your, your property, right? To somebody else in the church. Um, There's some kind of inheritance or whatever that you get from somebody. You give it to be managed by somebody and they steal it and they find a way to steal the, the property from you, okay? Here's the radical thing that Paul says, and I want you to listen to it and think, wow, would I really think like this? Here's what he says. Why not rather just like lose the property? Why not rather just, just forget about it? It's over. Just lose. It's, it might've been worth $3 million. Okay, just, it's done. See, see how that's like, whoa, three million dollars though. Like, you know what I could do with three million dollars? Like, I could set up, I could take care of my family. You could give a lot of righteous reasons to justify you breaking this text. Here's the problem. He says, it's suffering a massive defeat. He says, why not rather be defrauded? Not only wronged, maybe in an interpersonal relationship, why not rather be defrauded out of your stuff, out of your money, out of your property? Like, whatever this was, he's expecting them to give it up. Why? Verse number eight. He says, well, because you guys, these Corinthian Christians, and hopefully we are not falling into this category, he says, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers, right? I think right there, he's probably mainly talking to the people in the church who were doing the lawsuit, okay? I don't think he's talking to the people around the church, in the church that should have dealt with it. I think at that point, he's saying the people who were actually suing one another. What did you do? All right, well, one of the brothers probably stole and defrauded the other, and the other was trying to get it back, okay? And in both situations, he says, both of you guys are in the wrong, right? Even though one of you started it, to engage in this fight is going to be a bad thing. Why? Because the world looks at the church and makes an opinion about Christ by seeing your life, right? Same thing's true today. The world makes an opinion of your God based on you, as unfair as that might seem, right? And as, you know, we don't like that. Right? We want to point people to Christ. We should, and we will. But here's the thing. The world gets an opinion about Jesus based on how you live, how you act. And here's what he's saying. When two Christians are fighting with one another and going to court against one another, it shows that they cannot deal with their relationship problems on their own. There should have been someone wise enough in the church to deal with this. So what what should we make of this? Well, the big thing that we should take away is you and me, we need to learn how to deal with relationship problems in the church, right? The title of this sermon is called Solving Problems. I want you to be able to solve problems in your relationships, right? Even if it was something as big as dealing with money and dealing with property among two Christians. And although that doesn't happen that much, it does still happen in the church today. So I want you to learn, okay, how am I going to deal with problems when they come up? But more than that, I want you to learn how to deal with other people's problems, to be that arbitrator, to be that person that he says, who's wise enough to do this? I want you to raise your hand and say, I'm wise enough to do it. I've done it before. I've prepared for this. That's what I want you to think through tonight as we go through the sermon. So the first thing I want you to get, this is an overarching thing, but point number one is this. Don't damage the church's reputation with your sin. Don't damage the church's reputation with your sin. Now, it might not be money. It might not be greed. It might not be all those things, but it could be other things that you are accidentally or unintentionally or maybe even intentionally, but let's just 
go with benefit of the doubt here, maybe you are unintentionally, but seriously, damaging the church's reputation with your sin. Right? Remember, a lawsuit is public. Right? That's part of the problem with all this. They took their sins public. They took their relationship problem public. It was like they posted it on their, you know, on the board, so to speak. They, I mean, think about all lawsuits now, right? They're, they're public records. You can go in, you can read, you can hear, right? I mean, think about all the big time uh, lawsuits that just got finished up in our country recently, right? You're watching the case. You're watching people present information. Like, you have a full view of what's going on there. Right? That's the problem. If we take our problems and, like, show it to the world and say, hey, here's all, here's all the relationship problems, right? It'd be like this. It'd be like if I came up here and said, um, I've got a massive problem with my wife. Massive problem. Uh, me and my wife are not getting along, and um, just we're not getting along. She has a massively bad attitude. Just terrible attitude, right? That's how you know it's not true, right? Um, she's got a terrible attitude all the time. Horrible attitude. What am I supposed to do? I can't, I can't take it. I can't deal with it anymore, okay? You'd probably be like, okay, um, Pastor John, don't tell us this, please. This is uncomfortable, right? Um, two, if that's true, uh, I'm not the person you should be telling that to. Maybe you should, like, I don't know, deal with this on your own. Like, like you're the husband. How about you kind of deal with this or go to God or pray about that? Like, what are you going to tell me to do? You probably say it's inappropriate for me to mention at the first place, which, again, this is all hypothetical. The girl's never had a bad attitude. Um, but... I just want you to imagine, if I did it, you, you would have a visceral reaction. You'd be like, oh, like, that's weird. Don't do that. That's wrong. You're, you're, you're airing out your dirty laundry. That's the whole point, right? That's what these Christians were doing. Now I think, well, have I ever done that? Have I taken my problems, right, that are happening between me and another Christian, and am I using non-Christians as a sounding board for my problems with Christians, right? And if so, right, what are you communicating to those non-Christians? That's what Paul's getting at. Does Guys, we can't do that. It's a family issue, right? If me and my wife are having a problem, right, I'm not going to come tell you about it. <laughs> Hopefully not. If it got bad enough, yeah, I might seek help, but at least I'd try to deal with it on my own, right? Hopefully you think that way too in your family, right? You can imagine, right, if you had, you know, teenage kids, right, that's the scariest thing, right? I'm starting to think about Eden as a teenager. It's freaking me out. Um, but yeah, teenage kid, right? And she didn't like something that was going on in the household. If she went to, um, I don't know, the Brodies and said, hey, I don't like what my mom and dad are doing, um, the Brodies hopefully would say, well, talk to your mom and dad about that, right? That's a family issue, right? It's not for my ears to arbitrate. Like, it's not for me to arbitrate, right? It's the same idea with the church, right? There should be people. And again, that's why hopefully as you gain relationships in this church and as we're growing together, we're all getting better at this together. That you, through some good experiences and through some bad experiences, learn how to arbitrate problems for the next time. When someone less mature than you is, comes along, or maybe you're serving in the junior high ministry or high school ministry or whatever, and you got people that have problems, how do you arbitrate that? Right? Well, the first thing that we need to recognize is we can cause some damage to our church's reputation if we air out our sin to the world. So I want you to think, how do I deal with this sin? Right? How should they have dealt with it? I want to give you four quick little subpoints here, four little steps um, on how I think best to deal with conflict in, in church. Uh, what do we do? Well, first of all, um, I think the first step, obvious one, but I think you need to pray to have the right heart. Okay, pray to have the right heart. Okay, two verses for you on that. James chapter four, verse one. Let's start there. James chapter four, verse one says, "What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you?" Sounds like it's going to be helpful for us as we understand quarreling and fighting. James says, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you, right? We have wars, warring passions, right? That's why you have gotten into fights with people, because you want stuff that you don't have, or they want stuff that they don't have, and now you're in conflict. Then he says, you desire and you do not have, so, this is the worst sin here, you murder, right? That's the height. If you really want something, you don't have it, like Cain and Abel, right? You murder, like David and Uriah, right? You murder, says, you covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And then he says, you do not have because you do not ask. Some of these things that you're quarreling and fighting over, if you would have just prayed for them, maybe God would have granted them to you instead of having you fight over them, right? Then he says, some of you, you might ask, you might pray about it, but you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, okay? So there's a prayerlessness that is related to problems, okay? I want you to think that through. There's prayerlessness related to all these relationship problems, What's the first problem? Well, it's what's not there, right? Usually, two prayerful people are not coming 
to get at each other's throats, okay? That just doesn't happen very often. I've never seen two people in a counseling office who are really prayerful and then they're at each other's throats, right? It just doesn't happen very often, okay? So first step, pray for the right heart. Another verse for you there. First Peter chapter five, verse six and seven. First Peter five, six and seven. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, okay? We need to be humble before God, so at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you, okay? So if you're gonna go into a, relationship problem and you want to solve something, if there's problem between Christian A and Christian B and you're one of those people, okay, what's the first thing you should do? You need to pray and submit to God. Okay? Submit to God, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That doesn't mean complaining to God about everything bad in your life. It just means going to God and submitting to him and saying, God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Now think about how that changes, how this fight's going to go down. If two Christians are willing to go to God first and submit to him and say, I'm willing to do this however God wants me to do this, right? Half the time, problem disintegrates right there. Right? Then there's like, oh, well, we should just cover this offense. Oh, we should cover, oh, okay, well, then no problem, done. Right? A lot of the problems start when we don't pray. That's step number one. Step number two, Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17, say that when there are problems that need to be dealt with, the first step is to confront one another one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Step number two is confront one another one-on-one, -on -one, seeking peace, Matthew 18, Jesus talks about um, dealing with sin in the church. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay. You and him alone. How many problems would be solved if that happened right there? Again, if you're prayerful and if you go to people one-on-one, -on -one, okay, between you and him alone. Which again, you don't have to go to every Christian every time you're wronged. Okay, we're going to get to that later. Right? We already saw that in 1 Corinthians. He says, why not rather suffer wrong? Right? Sometimes if someone treats you badly right, and you know, it's, you can get over it. And sometimes it's just, okay, get over it. You don't have to deal with every problem. There's a glory in overlooking the fence. But then he says, if he listens to you, you've gained your brother, right? Great, they repent. Verse 16, Jesus says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, you're getting a couple more people involved who are witnesses, right? They know the problem, right? Let's say you were in a group situation and something happened and, and there's other people there. After you go to the person one-on-one, -on -one and they say, I refuse to repent, right? Which doesn't happen very often, but it will happen in your Christian life. Someone will do that to you. They'll say, I, I, no, I will not repent. I did not do anything wrong, okay? Well, then maybe two or three come along, and they confront. And if they still say no, okay, then what it says is then, if he refuses to listen, well, then go tell the church, right? Then maybe it's time to get your smog booter involved or, or to call me up about this or talk to Alexander about this if really the problem is not getting resolved there. And here's what he says. This is the, the, what we call formalized church discipline. He says, if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector. What does that mean? Disfellowshipped, right? Not a part of the, the, the core bond of the church anymore, right? He says, then, then you're supposed to take a step back in your relationship from them if they refuse to repent of sin. That's how high the standard is for God. That's what we talked about a lot last week with all that sexual sin that was going on in the church of Corinth, right? If there's a refusal to repent, because then, then there can be some relationship separation, but not before then. So step number two, confront one another one-on-one. -on -one. Step number three, once this confrontation happens, and maybe you do have the conversation, and there is a, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I confess, I did wrong, I did wrong, please forgive me, please forgive me. Okay, here's step number three. Forgive completely. Forgive completely right? and quickly if you can. Forgive completely and quickly. Now, so looking at Matthew 18, staying in Matthew 18, right after Jesus has this conversation with, with the apostles, Peter asks a good question. He says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Basically asking, how often, how much do I have to forgive a Christian who sins against me? Jesus said to him, or Peter asks as much as seven times. Right? Have you forgiven any person up to seven times? Right, maybe a couple people. Maybe only family members or really close friends. I bet you haven't even gone through this step with hardly anybody seven times. Maybe a couple of you have with some people close to you. But most of us, I can't think of anybody that I've had to do this with seven times personally. Like it just hasn't happened for me. So I haven't even hit Peter's number. But Jesus takes Peter's number and multiplies it. He says, no, not, not seven times, uh, 77 times. Right? Then I'm like, whoa, 77 times. Uh, I'll never hit that number. Exactly, okay? You're supposed to forgive. And then he goes into this parable that you know of as the parable of the unforgiving servant. You know that parable? Jesus tells this parable. He says, there's a person that was forgiven a massive debt, millions and billions of dollars, a debt that he could never repay. And then after they're forgiven all that debt, someone owes six or 700 bucks to them and they take him to court for it. Because after that happens, they got so mad. The master who forgave the big debt got so mad because he said, I forgave you so much. 
a debt you could never repay. And yet you are holding this other person to a small, insignificant, or even using 1 Corinthians 6's word, a trivial amount, small amount. Even though six says 700 bucks, it's a lot of money, right? That's not a trivial amount, but it is compared to what you've been forgiven. And Jesus says that person's gonna be cast out. He says, so it is to anyone who does not forgive his brother from his heart, right? So forgiveness, that's the next step. Right? Another verse for you on forgiveness, Ephesians chapter four, verse 25 to 27. These three verses talk about forgiving fast. He says, in this church community, he says, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one another, right? That's why it doesn't make sense for you to lie or cover up with other Christians because we're supposed to be members of a body, Christ's body. And he says, be angry and do not sin, and don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So this court case, great opportunity for the devil, right? Because the sun went down on the sin over and over and over again, right? You could, you could see that picture, right? If you're angry at somebody, right, and there's a problem, don't let the sun go down, right? It's figuratively and, and metaphorically and literally, you know, sometimes if it's during the day, someone wrongs you at night, you don't have to wait till the next day to do this, right? You can do it immediately, but the point is do it quickly, right? If there's a problem, forgive and forgive quickly, but get it, get it over with. That's step number three. So step number one, pray. Step number two, confront. Step number three, forgive. Step number four might be the hardest one of all. It's this, don't complain afterwards. Don't complain about the person afterwards. Problem is complaining shows that you have not really forgiven them of the sin, Complaining about a person saying, well, did you hear that this person did this? Well, this person did that. Well, this person did that. Well, it's complaining, right? Philippians chapter 2 says, um, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Philippians 2, 4, 14, sorry. Do all things without grumbling or complaining. And if you know verse 15, it's directly connected to what 1 Corinthians 6 has been talking about. It says this, that you, so don't grumble or complain, so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. So you be pure, you be holy in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, okay? So that you will look different than the world. Because you know what the world does? They complain about everything, right? When you were in school, what did you do with homework? You complained about it. And teachers. And when you were in college, you complained about your professors. And now people complain about their bosses, right? If you are the boss, everyone complains about you, right? Except for Sabrina. Um, just <laughs> no complaints. Um, Okay, but like how often at your work do people complain? It's like, it's everywhere, right? It's every, okay, so you don't complain. Guess what you do? Now you stand out. You don't complain about people who've wronged you. Guess what you do now? You stand out in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Then he says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Right? Picking up on the analogy of Jesus from Matthew 5. That we're supposed to be a light to the world. To show the world what Christ's followers look like. What it really means to live as God's people. To really image God in the world. Like you're, you, if you're a Christian, you're like the, the true human being. This is how life is supposed to be lived, right? Again, it will be lived sinlessly in the new world, but this is supposed to be the closest picture to that on the planet, the church. That's why he says, the problem in the church, you gotta deal with them in the church. Now, that's a lot, but what does it look like to learn how to deal with these problems in the church? Because Paul doesn't just get mad at these two people. He gets mad at the church for not dealing with it. Point number two is this. I want you to develop the skills to help Christians reconcile. I want you to develop the skills to help other Christians reconcile. So first thing is, I don't want to be the problem myself. Second thing is, I want to make sure that I'm equipped to help other people deal with their issues. He says something wild. He says, you will judge the new world. Okay, that's wild. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus talks to the disciples. He says, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, and you have followed me, you guys, you disciples, you apostles, you will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So, authority for these people. Paul says, all the saints, you will have some level of authority and role in the new world. Right? Remember, the new world, what I'm talking about is not cotton ball clouds. I'm talking about when Jesus comes back, and we're living on a real planet, where you will have real hands and fingers and eyeballs and ears, and you'll really eat food, and you'll really travel, maybe quickly like Jesus did, but you'll travel, right? You'll have a job, an occupation. You'll have um, some semblance of family, although it's not the same as here on this planet, right? You'll have some tribal designation, right? Which, because he says every tongue, tribe, and nation, right? There's some type of, you know, difference. We're not all going to, you know, wear white robes the entire time, right? You will have a real new life in the new world, okay? So picture that. And remember, we should always be thinking of that. And then here's what he says. Okay, so you're destined for that. 
if you're in Christ. So what about the little things right now, the little trivial problems? One day you're going to deal with angels, right? Which Think that through. What does a dispute between angels look like? Have you ever thought about that? Like, what? what? What's a dispute between angels? Like, how do you, I mean, what does that even look like? How should we give glory to God more this way or that way? Like, seriously, think about it, right? That's a really weird thing. If you really start to think about it. what does it look like for you one day? Like, who are you to sit and judge angels, right? That might be how you feel. But Paul says one day as a saint, you will do that. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, you're gonna be dealing, and think that through, with problems where there's no sin involved. It's the d- decision between what's better and what's best, okay? So now, when there's sin involved in relationship problems here on earth, the whole idea is it should be so obvious to you, right? If your mind is being changed and transformed, as Romans 12 says, to be more like Christ, as you're thinking about what is the will of God, what does this book say about what the will of God is, as your mind is being trained in this, right, your sense of right and wrong, justice and injustice should grow and get better, right? So much so that you should be able to deal with sin problems in the church. Like, again, I just think that expectation feels so high, does it not? Does that feel so high? Like, how would we judge angels? But the point is, if you're gonna judge angels one day, you should be learning and growing in your counseling to other people. Because he says these problems are, are trivial, right? Which again, I don't, don't start your conversation with people you know, in trouble and say these are trivial problems, right? Um, probably not a good start. Unless they need it. Sometimes they need it, right? Um, sometimes you need to tell them, this is stupid, right? Stop complaining about this. Stop arguing about this. You guys need to repent. Just stop it, right? Um, maybe you need to do that. Paul does it sometimes, right? But oftentimes, there's a lot of gentleness with it. There's a lot of compassion and understanding and listening, right? But if you think that for some reason you will never be competent or able to help counsel other Christians, right? If you're thinking, I will never do that, okay? I don't think you're thinking very biblically because the biblical expectation is that someday you will. You might not now, right? Some of you are competent. Some of you are like, I know the scriptures. I've gone through this. I'm a mature Christian. I can help other people, right? That's great. A lot of you are, are that. Some of you are new Christians. Some of you maybe are not even Christians yet, and you need to understand these things. But the whole point is, how do we get closer to there, okay? Romans 15, chapter 14, Paul says that a group of Christians who, remember, book of Romans, who's it written to? Romans. Has Paul ever been there? Answer, no. Paul had never even been there. But here's what Paul says about them. He says, because of your reputation, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct or counsel one another, right? Instruct, nutheteo, right? That's the word admonish, exhort, right? Um, He doesn't even know them personally. He knows a lot of them personally, as he's going to say in Romans chapter 16. He's going to list a lot of names, people he knows. But the reality is he's never even been there. But he knows you're competent to counsel. You're full of goodness, which again, um, it's the same book of Romans that says in chapter 3 that no one's good. No, not one, right? Just think that through. And then he says, no, but you saints, you know, you are filled with goodness, right? I believe both of those, okay? You have to believe both of those if you're looking at the book of Romans, right? But you have to understand what he's saying. What he's saying is, you Christians, I, I'm confident, right? You're, you know the Bible, right? You know the scriptures. You're mature. I trust you to be able to deal with the problems in the church. That's what he's telling these Romans. So this is not some out of reach. It's not like Paul would go to any church and say, none of you got y'all a bunch of losers, right? Like that's not, that's not what he's saying, right? The Corinthians really were struggling in this area, and maybe we are too. But the point is there are churches that do well at that, okay? Another example, Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. That might be the more famous chapter that you know, Galatians 6, 1 to 3. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, right? So what is the expectation? That there are people in the church who are competent, ready, right? He calls them spiritual. The idea is, if you know... Galatians 6 comes after a chapter called Galatians 5, right? Galatians 5, what's it all about? What's the end of Galatians 5 about? Someone tell me. Fruits of the Spirit, right? If you're led by the Spirit, right? So that's what he's talking about, people who are led by the Spirit. And then he gives the fruit of the Spirit. He says, you got the fruit of the Spirit, right? That means that you are walking in step with the Spirit. That means that you're able to do Galatians 6, 1 to 3. It says, you who are spiritual, help those, restore those in a spirit of gentleness who are caught in sin. Then he says, keep watching yourself. Make sure that you aren't tempted. Because a lot of times, you help someone through a certain sin, guess what Satan goes after you with? That very sin. Because you can be tempted to think, I would never do what this person's doing. Right? Satan will come and smack you down if you think that. Next verse. 
Galatians 6, 2. It says, bear one another's burdens, right? If people got problems, relationship drama, sin, bear their burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? He just said, there's no, beyond these things, there's no law, right? In the end of Galatians 5, what's the law of Christ? What's the royal law, as James 2 says, right? Love one another, right? Love. Jesus says it over and over again, a new commandment I give to you. It's really an old commandment. Love one another. That's what he's saying. Bear one another's burdens. What are you doing? You're loving. You're doing what I would do. Then he says in verse 3, he says, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So another caveat there says if you're going to be quick to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I got this. I'm good. Yeah, I, I, I'm spiritually ready. I'm, I'm there. Right? I got this. Right? He says be careful. Because <laughs> if you think you're ready, you might not be ready. Be careful. Don't deceive yourself. So help develop the skills to help other Christians reconcile. Right? Reconcile. What does that word mean? Two people who are not friends becoming friends again. Right? Jesus uses the word peacemaker right, in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the peacemakers. I think there's an element vertical and horizontal to that. He says that you are a peacemaker where people come and are reconciled with God, but also that you are a helpful agent in your life to get other people who are not getting along to get them to get along. Right? Um, there's a difference between being a peacemaker and a meddler. Right? You know what the, the biblical word meddler is? Right? That's, the, that's the old lady who wants to get in everyone's problems. Right? Sorry for all the old ladies. Right? None of you are old ladies, so you don't care. Um, but you, you, know, you know the type, right? Karen, right? Um, hopefully you're not named Karen. But like the person who wants to get in everyone's problems in detail. That's not what, what being a peacemaker is. Right? Um, that's a meddler. Right? That's getting in people's issues and spreading them. Right? That's not what I'm saying. But being a peacemaker. Are you a peacemaker? Right? Do the people in your life know, hey, that's, that's a Christian and that's a peacemaker, right? I, I've seen them do it in the family, right? I've seen them do it in the workplace. I've seen them get two parties that are not reconciled so they can be reconciled. Because ultimately, right, if you are a Christian, like I said at the beginning, Paul expects that you have the faculties, abilities, and wisdom to do this in a way that non-Christians can't. Why, okay? Why is that? First Corinthians 1, what does Paul say to them? He says, Where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Right? You understand that if you want to seek arbitration between you and another person, you're not going to find better help outside the community of Christ. Right? I mean, think that through. If you're thinking, well, you know, the people in my life, they don't know what they're doing. Right? Christians are terrible at you know, helping people solve problems. I'm going to go to non-Christians. Right? just want you to know, warn you, Paul says don't do that, but even more than that, here's why you shouldn't do that, because there's not that wisdom that you have with mature Christians, right? Which is why if you do have problems, I would advise you, seek someone who's more mature than you. Don't seek someone who's less mature, right? So you can get the result that you want, right? So that you can manipulate someone into taking your side. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying find a mature Christian. If there are real problems between people, even in this group, maybe in your small group, okay, here's what you need to do. Find a more mature Christian and take the problem to them after you've dealt with it one-on-one. Hebrews 5, 14 says, Solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice. Okay, think that through. Trained by constant practice. That's what this is going to take. It's hard, but the whole point is, solid food, he's saying this meat of the word of God. The, the solid food, right? The stuff that Micah and Eden still are not eating, right? They can't take solid food. They're, they're not mature enough, right? They can't take it. Right? You can. You had Cafe Rio tonight. Unless you had salad like I did. Um, then you had half of what Cafe Rio offers. Um, point is, right, you can eat solid food. You're mature enough, right? Those babies can't. Why? Well, because you're older, developed, right? Here's what he's saying. Christians should be able, after constant practice, to deal with these relationship problems. So we need to do that. But thinking back to ourselves again, we're thinking about this chapter. The, the hardest hitting verses come at the end. First Corinthians 6 seven and eight. To have lawsuits is a lose-lose. And when you take your problems outside the church, you've already lost. Even one step further, I think if you take all your problems and publicize them, right, which I think is the whole point of the problem with the lawsuits, right, he's not saying you shouldn't have sought arbitration. He, in fact, says you should have sought it. You just should have sought it with the saints, not with the non-Christians, okay? So the problem is not in seeking arbitration. The problem is where you took it. Okay? It's where you took the sin. You shouldn't have taken it there. If we think about what he says next, he says, why not rather suffer wrong? 
That is a radically different mindset than most of us have. I want to challenge you with that. The mindset you probably have when you're wronged is I want justice, right? You you have that feeling. I want to pursue a defense of my rights, okay? Those are all good things in legal jargon, right? This is good, right? Yeah, we're Americans, right? We want to seek and defend our rights, okay? I just want you to hear this, okay? What does he say? He says, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? He says the opposite thing than what we're conditioned to think, okay? Now, take this back to relationship problems, okay? If you're the one who's hurt by something, it's unfair, someone treated you poorly, okay? If that's true, Instead of taking your problems outside the church, taking them and sounding them to the non-Christians in your life, here's what he says. It'd be better for you to suffer wrong. Because Jesus, hopefully, has prepared you for that. Hopefully, as you've read his word and thought about his life, he's prepared you for what it looks like to suffer unjustly. To suffer at the hands of people that should have loved him and be treated badly. It doesn't mean seeking that out. It doesn't mean seeking persecution. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying... This should be part of your expectation. Point number three is this. Expect to be wronged and plan to seek peace. Expect to be wronged and in so doing, when you expect to be wronged, okay? Plan to seek peace. In those moments when you're thinking, okay, I know that people in my small group are going to wrong me one day. Seek peace. I'm gonna be wrong. People are gonna treat me bad. People are gonna say bad things about me, right? You're gonna hear gossip about yourself, Maybe people will slander you, even worse than gossip, right? They might make up stuff and throw your name under the bus, okay? Expect that, and then what do you do, right? Plan to seek peace. That's what he's saying. Jesus modeled this. One verse that's just an obvious verse. You probably already thought of this verse, but Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Philippians 2, 3 and 4, what does it say? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself, okay? That, that, like, you get that down, you're gonna, you're gonna get this, okay? Then he says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, right? We are all interested naturally in our own interests. You are primarily focused tonight on your interests, right? Where you're gonna sit, who you're gonna talk to, what you're gonna eat, right? Right? You're just gonna do that, Naturally, here's what he says. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Then he says, have this mind among yourselves. So I'm not saying, hey, two people in the church should do this. It's like, we should all do this. He says, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is Jesus's attitude. This is his mentality, right? How can I serve others? If I'm wronged, if I'm defrauded, fine. How can I help other people? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter five, verse 39. He says, Don't resist the one who's evil. When you're suffering real persecution, don't resist the one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. This is hard. This is not natural. And he says, if anyone should sue you, which again, I think that's what Paul has in mind here. He says, do you not know? It's like the words of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, that had to be what they're talking about all the time. Even if the book of Matthew hadn't been finalized at that point, which I think it probably was finalized at that point or around the time the book of 1 Corinthians is written. But even if it hadn't, you know that they were talking about what Jesus taught. Jesus taught the themes of the Sermon on the Mount all the time. You know that in the teachings of Jesus that they were sharing with one another, you know it had to have come up multiple times. Well, if anyone sues you legally and takes your tunic, right, they sue you for your tunic, here's what he says, let him have your cloak as well, right? Once your undershirt, give him your, your jacket too. Why? How? Well, it says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who begs from you. Don't refuse the one who wants to borrow from you. It says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, right? That was a Jewish thing that people said that was wrong. It says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Right? That should be the attitude that we have towards those who are wronging us. It's so easy for us to adopt the opposite mentality, right? In Luke, the way Luke records this teaching, right, which might have actually been a different time. I can get into that later, but he says, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From the one who takes away your cloak, don't withhold your tunic either. Same idea, right? Just two tunic and cloak flipped, right? Same idea there. Jesus not only taught that, he also modeled that. If you think of First Peter, he says that 
it's a precious thing in the sight of God when one of his people suffers unjustly. Right? It's like God looks at that and has, has a special care when, when his Christians, when you and I suffer unjustly. It's a gracious thing in the sight of God. Says, for, for to this you've been called. Right? This is what you signed up for when you became a Christian. You surrendered some of your rights when you became a Christian. That was part of the cost. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you may follow in his steps. What does it mean to follow in Jesus' steps when it comes to being wronged? It means not always seeking justice. And you might say, well, that doesn't make sense because God is just. I care about justice. I want to see justice in the world. Okay? Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Right? Because that's basically what this lawsuit was. It's like, you did me wrong, now I'm going to do you wrong. I'm going to get back what I got. Two wrongs, right? Don't make a right, as they say. But, it says, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. See how Paul's mentality here is like, okay, you should be thinking about what would be honorable to, to the whole world, to all the non-Christians. Think, what's honorable? And he says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. That's the punchline, right? Leave it to the wrath of God because you recognize, as we've already seen in the book of 1 Corinthians, when someone wrongs you and gets away with it, are they getting away with it? Never. Never. No one will ever get away with anything. The only person, the only people in this world who are going to get away with stuff is you. You thought about that? Right? You, if you're in Christ, you're the only one that's ever going to get away with what you've done. Just you. Right? The outside world is going to be judged. Right? You recognize that. Revelation 20 is very clear. According to what they have done. Right? So it's not some general, like, bleh judgment from God that he just like pours out on everybody equally, right? There's going to be a very careful exacting of justice that God will bring one day from everyone. And if you are, are hidden in Christ, remember who pays for your sin? Jesus. Right? Jesus pays for your sin. Jesus has righted all the wrongs in your life. Right? You've been forgiven. A lot of the people who wrong you, you might say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of non-Christians now. I'm not thinking in the church. I'm thinking of people outside the church, right? Just remember, when they wrong you, what's happening, right? They are, what Romans says, storing up judgment for themselves, okay? So you can sit and stew and say, I need justice now, I need justice now, or you can recognize the truth that God will judge them in a way far worse than you could ever bring justice, right? All, all the justice that you see in this world, whether it's good or incomplete or, or evil, it's, it's all minimal, right, compared to what God will do. It's hard. What if I lose stuff, right? Paul's literally telling this guy, lose your million-dollar house. Lose the, the inheritance. Whatever this is, give it up, okay? That's hard to do if you don't trust God, right? If you think that you are the manager of all your stuff, if you think that you earned all your money, if you think all the stuff that you have belongs to you, that is a very hard thing to do. But if you recognize, as the Bible so often teaches, that God will take care of his people, even when they're wrong. And furthermore, even if you had everything taken away from you, because now you have the body of Christ, you'll be taken care of. You'll be okay. Even if you're not okay. <laughs> As Hebrews 10 says, right? The, the, the Christians there, they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property because they knew they had an abiding inheritance, something lasting that, that's better than money or even a reputation, right? Because a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today doesn't even have to do with money. It doesn't really have to do with lawsuits. It has to do with this person wronged me. This person messed up my reputation. I need to be vindicated before everybody, right? That's probably the more common problems in a group like this. It's probably not you guys suing each other for not Venmoing each other for coffee, right? Um, it's probably not what you're going to law, court about, right? Probably more about relationship problems reality is we should do what Jesus told us to right? and seek first the kingdom of God, right? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all the things that you're concerned about and anxious about, those will be added to you. God will take care of you. Right? Care about peace in the church more than having everything go your way. It's just an easy thing to say and I know it's harder than that. Reminds me, um, there's someone in this room right now who's wronged me, um, who's yelled at me, who's scratched me in the face, who's woke me up in the middle of the night, who's even thrown up on me, and I sometimes feel like it's on purpose. <laughs> it's that girl right there, that little, little tiny uh, girl. Um, 
You thought, you didn't know that was going. Um, (laughs) That was a point. But I don't mind. It's kind of cute, actually. You know, she hasn't pooped on me yet. She pooped on her. Um, She peed on you today. That was good. Um, Yeah. Mike is probably worse, though. Right? He's got a longer range. Um, (laughs) But it's okay, right? It's not the worst thing. It's kind of cute, right? And they grab you. I literally even grabbed my face last night. I was like trying to like, shh, like be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Shh, shh. And she like just grabbed her, her my face, right? My cheek and just dug her, her nails in, right? So we need to cut. Um, <laughs> and just like held my face for like a little bit. And I thought like, you know what you're doing right now. And then we'll feed her the bottle and immediately calm down. And I'm like, you, you, kn- come on. Like, you're a complainer, man. Like, that's bad. But you know what? Every time she does it, there's like this part of me like, oh, that's, that's really funny. Like, that's cute. It doesn't matter, right? I love her too much to be upset at her. Um, yeah, she, yeah, she doesn't really know what she's doing. It's not a totally fair comparison, but um, my love for her surpasses my, my desire for justice with her. <laughs> Obvious, right? There, there's a question for you. Does your love for your brother surpass your desire to have every wrong righted with your brother? Does your love for the person sitting next to you surpass your desire to have everything that goes wrong in your life righted in this life? I'm not saying you should start to adopt some you know, baby love for the people around you. That would be really weird. But I think if you loved one another more, and if I loved you more, and you loved me more, that as a Christian community, we would do a lot better at getting through problems like this. And that's really the ultimate solution, right? It's to love like Jesus loved, right? And if we love like Jesus loved and we look to his example and what he taught us, we're going to do well with this. So we're going to not talk about this in small groups because I left you with eight minutes. <laughs> Guys, I am the worst at timing. Forgive me, please. Don't hold it against me. Um, now you have to. You have to not hold this against me because um, we just preached about this. But here's what we're going to do. For a couple minutes, we got two questions. I want to talk about this in your tables. Um, we got two quick questions, um, but you're all, your tables are big enough. Um, I want you to talk through this, but let's pray before we get into this. Let's pray that God would help us seek peace. God would help us with these relationship problems and further that we would be better reflections of Christ in this world because of it. Let's pray. God, please help us with this. It goes against our flesh. It goes against our selfish desires to have every wrong righted to always be in the right, to get back at others. Just pray that this text, this sermon would help all of us, would help me, help this whole group, that we would be more like your son. We'd forgive. That we would love more than we need to have our problems fixed. I pray that we would be helpful counselors to others. Please help us all get there. Pray that we all get better, more competent to encourage and counsel one another. Please help us with that. We want to glorify you. We want the world to be one to Jesus Christ. We want to do that in little tiny ways here in South Orange County. We want to see more people um, saved by the gospel of Jesus. And we know that we hinder that work when we are selfish and disunified and all those things. So please help us with this. and Please motivate us to put it into practice tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.